with our call to worship. This is based on Psalm 104. Praise the Lord, O my soul. The Lord wraps himself in light as with a garment. May the glory of the Lord endure forever. May the Lord rejoice in his works. Would you join me in a word of prayer? Come, Holy Spirit. We welcome you into our midst today, and we desire to be filled with your presence. You have called us out of darkness into your light, and we worship you. We thank you for the wonderful things you have done and the ways that you have transformed and are transforming our lives. Forgive us, Heavenly Father, for the things we have done or left undone and thereby rejected your power and authority in our lives. God, break the chains of sin that bind us and strengthen us against temptation that we might honor and glorify your name by the ways that we live. Let our lives be so transformed that others recognize your mercy and grace. We ask, Lord, that you would be present in our worship today and fill us with your Holy Spirit so that we might be sent into the world as witnesses to your great love. We ask you to be present with all whom we have named or name in our heart who are in need today in various ways. We ask for healing, guidance, provision, and comfort. Your will be done in our lives and in the lives of our loved ones. Thank you, God. We pray all of these things in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Our opening hymn is number 173, Christ Whose Glory Fills the Sky.
You may be seated. Our scripture this morning comes from Joel chapter 2, verses 28 to 32. And afterward, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams. Your young men will see visions. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days. I will show wonders in the heavens and on the earth, blood and fire and billows of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. For on Mount Zion and in Jerusalem there will be deliverance, as the Lord has said, even among the survivors whom the Lord calls. Our children's message today comes from Crossroads Kids Club. God's Story, The Prophets. So part of God's story is about the prophets, and it goes like this. Prophets are people who hear from God and share it. We sometimes think of prophets as people who know the future, but really, they know whatever God tells them, which could be anything, because God knows everything. Anyway, nowadays, God speaks to all of us. But before Jesus came and before there was the Bible, God spoke to his family through just a few people. Some of those people were prophets. Sixteen of God's prophets have books in the Bible named after them. And today, we are talking about them. It starts with Isaiah and ends with Malachi. These guys are a pretty big part of the Old Testament, so let's check out what God said to his family through them. This won't take long because even though they lived in different places and hundreds of years apart, they had basically the same message because people have always had the same problem. We disobey God. So the prophets told God's family, you've sinned, now you're in trouble. Of course, the prophets didn't just say this. They got God's family's attention by doing crazy things to show how bad life can get when we're far from God. Like Isaiah, who walked around in his underwear for three years to show what it looks like to lose everything. Or Jeremiah, who hid his belt under a rock until it rotted, then dug it up again so God's family could see what it looks like to be completely destroyed. Seriously, kids, that's in the Bible. And actually, it gets even crazier. Check it out for yourself. See, God is holy, which means he's perfect. He created us to be like him and follow him. But instead, we choose to disobey him, which is sin. Sin has to be punished because if God is perfect, he can't pretend it doesn't matter when we hurt each other or ourselves or his creatures or the earth. The thing is, though, God loves us anyway. He doesn't want his family to be in trouble. So he sent good news through the prophets, too. They said, if you stop sinning and follow God instead, he'll have mercy on you. Mercy means not getting punished, even though you deserve it. Problem is, nobody could stop sinning for very long. Well, God had a plan for that, too. He told some of the prophets, like Isaiah and Zechariah, that one day he would send someone perfect to earth. Someone who could take the punishment for everybody else's sin. And if our sin was paid for, that would mean we weren't in trouble anymore, which means we could come close to God. If 16 different prophets over hundreds of years all said pretty much the same thing, it must be important, right? Even now, for us. After all, we've sinned too. And we need a rescuer. And since the rescuer already came, we can follow God and choose to accept that Jesus took our punishment, which means it doesn't separate us from God anymore. And we can talk to God, but also hear from him, which means we can prophesy too. And that's the story of the prophets. So, in case you missed it, here's the quick version. Prophets hear from God and share it. God told a whole bunch of them the same thing. Sin separates people from God. Stop sinning and obey. But God's family couldn't stop sinning. So God promised a rescuer. Hundreds of years later, the rescuer came. And now we can be close to God. We can hear from him. And we can share it. And that's a part of God's story. Our uh, gospel lesson today comes from Luke chapter 9, verses 28 to 32. About eight days after Jesus said this, he took Peter, John, and James with him and went up onto a mountain to pray. As he was praying, the appearance of his face changed and his clothes became a bright, as bright as a flashing of light. 
Two men, Moses and Elijah, appeared in glorious splendor, talking with Jesus. They spoke about his departure, which he was about to bring to fulfillment at Jerusalem. Peter and his companions were very sleepy, but when they became fully awake, they saw his glory and the two men standing with him. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. We talked last week about spiritual gifts. Some gifts are given for a long term. If you're a gifted administrator, evangelist, or musician, you may keep those gifts much of your life. Other gifts, however, are given for a season. God used each of the prophets for a different length of time. Some were lifetimes and others were for just a season or to deliver one particular message to a certain community, like Jonah, for example. Our scripture today affirms that God will continue to use his people to prophesy. God still speaks to his people and still gives dreams and visions about your life or a message God wants you to give to someone else or a community or to your church. But our passage in Luke's gospel teaches us that we must be spiritually awakened in order to receive God's message and be used by God in this way. So let us pray that the Holy Spirit would awaken each of us and speak God's will to us. Holy Spirit, this is a difficult concept to teach. You work in and through each of us in a variety of ways, and sometimes in ways that are inconceivable by our understanding. So quiet our minds and open our hearts to receive your word today. Help us to grow in our relationships with you so that we might know your voice and boldly proclaim what you say to us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. In Carolyn Moore's book, Supernatural, she recounts several stories of heavenly encounters. Some of them are her personal experiences, and others were shared with her by the person who had experienced that encounter. In chapter 19, she tells one man's story of a near-death peek into heaven. Moore had just finished a funeral service when a man approached her and shared his story of having died in a car accident. He said he met Jesus. He didn't see his face, but he knew it was Jesus because he saw the holes in his hands. He remembered seeing a tunnel of light and Jesus sending him back to this life before he got to the end of the tunnel. After sharing this story, Moore writes, I stood there in the doorway of that little chapel and let the conversation sink in. I looked at that man who, some, who seemed to glow with faith, and I let the truth of heaven wash over me. I wondered to myself, how many normal, everyday, average people have died from heart attacks and snake bites and allergic reactions only to see Jesus and taste that golden light before being sent back here to live another life? How many have been handed the gift of assurance in the form of a car crash they didn't survive and then did? Perhaps more relevant is this question. Would I recognize it if heaven came to me? On that mountain, while Jesus was praying, Peter, James, and John were reportedly very sleepy. They might have missed the whole scene, but they were awakened to it and witnessed the power and presence of God in the transfiguration of Christ. It makes me wonder what they missed when they fell asleep in the garden while Jesus prayed before he was betrayed. And then I wonder what have I missed because I haven't been spiritually awake? What gift of assurance or message of prophecy, vision, or dream has God wanted to give to me or to you or to this church, but we've missed it? I don't want to miss another message. I probably will because I'm still a sinner. While I'm saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ, I'm not yet perfect. I am participating in the process of sanctification, but sometimes I don't, whether consciously or unconsciously. So I want to make a conscious decision to choose to be spiritually awake. 
Joel's prophecy at the end of chapter 2 is fulfilled at Pentecost, which we'll celebrate next week. In this prophecy, the Lord says that through the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, your sons and daughters will prophesy. Old men will dream dreams and visions. Old men will dream dreams. Your young men will see visions. If the Holy Spirit has truly been outpoured on this body of believers, then shouldn't someone be hearing from the Lord and prophesying? We ought to be sharing our dreams and visions and praying together for biblical understanding and interpretation so that we might do the will of the Lord together. We have to be awakened to the voice of the Lord. To awaken means to, re to rouse from sleep. If someone says, in some ways, let me start that paragraph over. <laughs> to awaken means to rouse from sleep. In some ways, I believe that the events of the past year have awakened some of us. Have you ever gotten into a car to go somewhere but ended up at work instead, not really remembering the trip? You were on autopilot. Your brain and muscle memory took you to the place you go most frequently instead of your intended destination. It's crazy how the subconscious can do that. However, if something unexpected happens on that trip, like another car pulls out in front of you and you have to react, then you, can, you get snapped back to reality. Prior to 2020, a lot of us had gone on a spiritual autopilot. And then 2020 happened. We were not able to seek the Lord and come together for worship in the autopilot ways. So we were awakened from our spiritual slumber. We have awakened to a desire for Christian community, for corporate worship, and meeting the newly recognized needs of our neighbors. If we intentionally seek to connect with the Holy Spirit, we'll also be awakened to receive God's word, dreams and visions for our own lives and for the ministry of our church. If you're still on autopilot, wake up. Because the Lord wants to show you something and teach you something. We can know if a message or a vision is from God by turning to scripture and through prayer and discernment together. The messages of the prophets were confirmed through signs and wonders, and they were basically all the same message, just at a different time or in a different community. You're sinners. God is perfect. Sin must be punished. Turn to God and stop sinning, and God will be merciful. In Christ, that same message continues today with one change. Christ took the punishment for sin, and through him, by the power of the Holy Spirit, we can choose to be cleansed of our sin. Are you awake to receive that message? And will you proclaim it as the Spirit directs you? Next week, we have the joy of celebrating the fruits of our ministry as three students will come to confirm their faith in a special joint worship service at the lake. This service is not the end of their journey, but a milestone along the way of the Christian life. It's a milestone, a milestone for these students, for their families, and for our churches as we celebrate the work of the Holy Spirit that has awakened them to faith and welcome a fresh outpouring of the Spirit on all of us. Through our tithes and offerings, we provide for this and other ministries of the church, which equip us to go proclaim the gospel and make disciples, walking together the Christian life. The offering plate is located at the entrance, or you may send your gifts in care of Holly. Our closing hymn is number 465, Holy Spirit, Truth Divine.
Receive these words as your benediction. Go forth fully awake to receive the Holy Spirit and proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ. Amen.